Welcome to all of you. Our goal tonight is to cover as much ground as possible. Every candidate will answer every question, and each of you have 90 seconds to do so. We're going to begin with Freddie O'Connell, and we're going to start talking traffic. Anyone who's lived in Nashville for a while knows traffic is worse than ever. Most people agree we need some sort of mass transit, but settling on a plan and actually rolling it out, that's going to take years. What is your plan for not only creating, but communicating a traffic and transit plan that people can get behind? Freddie. I wouldn't say it's going to take years, Rory. We've got <clears throat> two great tools um, and a budget that's ready to go. We've got uh, MTA, WeGo Public Transit's uh, in motion strategic plan, which is still active. We've got uh, Mayor Cooper put us through an important exercise of a comprehensive transportation plan that isn't just transit-based, it's based on traffic. We're pairing that with a tool that's already underway. In fact, we will have, uh, within a year or so, a new opportunity in downtown Nashville that's going to be a, a pilot of a public safety and traffic management center, and that hits at all of these things. We are the last major American city without a transit system. We've got a three-year work plan that I'm ready to implement on day one. In fact, on Tuesday, the Metro Council approved a budget that I worked hard on to make sure that in that plan, in that budget, uh, that the next mayor will inherit and start working on on day one in October that we had the tools necessary to do that. So we will have a transit system that is emerging, uh, building a better bus system. We will have traffic management center for the first time with technology helping us have uh, better traffic flow. And we will start one of the 15 fixes I've proposed that you can find on my website. Uh, it talks about the need for better departmental coordination. That means instead of taking projects on a one-by-one -one basis, we take them all in one, one fell swoop and look at it as a system. So we are well prepared. It's not going to take years. And we will do the part that is the hardest, which is resuming the conversation about dedicated funding. Freddie, thank you. Alice Roll. Yeah, well, thank you. And that is an incredibly important question for so many of us that spend too much time in traffic and not enough time with our families. But I do think that it's an area where we can learn a lot from when we took in Nashville a go-it-alone approach and we failed spectacularly. So this reset around our regional transportation and traffic uh, issues has to come from all of our regions. We have currently a terrific plan that has been endorsed by about 20 regional and municipal mayors in our area. And they have, in the moving forward plan, said that the mayor's most important next job is to quarterback a dedicated transit funding stream with the input of our voters so that we can leverage state and federal dollars that currently Davidson County taxpayers are not able to leverage. We're one of only 25 regions in the country, in the top 25 markets, that doesn't have dedicated transit funding. So I think job one is to make sure that we can get those dollars and that we are not going it alone and solving our traffic challenges. Secondly, it is working with our regional county mayors to look at ways to collect more cars and bring those high-speed buses in a, more, in a more efficient manner so that we're collecting many of our commuting neighbors before we bring them into the city. Thank you. Thank you. Matt Wilson. Thanks, Rory. Thank you, David. And thank you to Belmont for hosting this debate. You know, I'm a Nashville native, and the Nashville that I grew up in, it was a lot quicker to get around our town. It slowed down. It's tough for folks. I grew up uh, just, just up the street from here, and it's not the same city that I grew up in. I uh, today released a plan that talks about transit, infrastructure, affordable housing, education, the important issues, and I was asked the viewers to go look at Wiltshire.com to see the full list of plans that we rolled out. Included in it is a plan to improve transportation in Nashville, and we do need to have better throughput on the roads that we have and work with regional partners. But we need to invest in mass transit today. It's too late already. And I talked in the report, and I actually talked at the last debate here, about having mass transit from the airport to downtown along Murfreesboro Pike. The AMP, which we tried, was defeated in part because there was insufficient right-of-way along West End. But there's a lot of right-of-way available along Murfreesboro Pike. And the 55 Murfreesboro is already the highest ridership bus line that we have. So we're well positioned to get 60 or maybe even 70 percent of the cost of this project paid for by the federal government. The airport authority can pitch in too. And spending other people's money is always a lot better to leverage the infrastructure that we have. 
But what's most important about this plan is building affordable housing at transit stops so folks who work downtown or at the airport can get to work without paying $50 for parking. We'll start that day one when I'm mayor. Thank you. Sharon Hurt. Thank you so much. I also <laughs> want to thank Belmont, my alma mater. It's always great to be here. I see Dr. Fish, and he's always just a great inspiration to me. I first want to say that I worked with the federal, state, and local government when I created a senior shuttle transportation program, and we have to come together and make that happen. When I worked with the Metro Planning Organization, they focused on the regional transportation. I think we've got two issues here traffic congestion and transportation. The traffic congestion is something separate. I've been working with a national organization through the National League of Cities that is focused on how to eliminate traffic congestion. I'm a common sense kind of individual pragmatic. I think some of the things we gotta do, we need to just do it, and we need to do it now. That means that we can get some flex schedules for our students, ensure that we have flex schedules for our businesses to make sure that we eliminate so much traffic on the roads. We're also gonna have to regulate our HOV lanes to make sure that our regional surrounding counties are able to get back and forth. I would love to see an express bus go on that one dedicated lane, ensuring that people are able to get back and forth. I really want to call it the Titans Express because I think when people have something like that signature with those who they know they love and inspire to be, they will pay for it. And I think that we will be able to reach our surrounding counties. Thank you. Jeff Yarbrough. Uh, thanks, and thanks for having us tonight. So there's no question that we're a couple decades behind on transit in Nashville, but it's not like we've delayed transit because we've been focusing on making it easier to get around by car or bike or by foot. It's just too hard to get around anywhere using any means of transportation, and the next mayor's got to take that seriously. It, right now, it feels like driving an obstacle course to get to work where you got to use your GPS to navigate around road closures and dodge potholes. And Nashville's not going to invest in real deal transit and give us the leeway to build more infrastructure until we're taking care of the infrastructure we've got. I do think that fundamentally when it comes to transit, we've got to stop choosing a new transit plan every time we elect a new mayor. Transit is a decision that is made over the course of decades, not four-year terms. And the job of the next mayor is to forge a strategy so that we are taking care of building on this, what's been done by the Cooper administration, which is moving down towards dedicated lane transit on that Murfreesboro Pike corridor towards the airport, but also building the regional and federal infrastructure for a, more, for a larger scale plan. I have worked with the last two governors in order to negotiate and build uh, greater investments in infrastructure, and we're going to have to have a team-based approach if we're going to get real transit done in this city. Thank you. Heidi Campbell. Yeah, so I mean, we can't have a transit plan every time we elect a new mayor, but we so far we don't have any transit plan, so we have to have some transit plan. And um, that's going to require a bold vision. A world-class city of this caliber needs a much better transit plan than we have. And WeGo is doing a good job, but we have to have a bigger plan. And so I think we should look at a TDOT study that, to move Radnor Yards, which is this big tra uh, train switching yard next to Hundred Oaks, um, out to Wilson County, or um, there are a couple of other options because what that does is that creates a freight workaround so that trains do not have to come through our city and it frees up our internal rail lines so that we can use them maybe for rail, but if people don't want to do rail, we could possibly look at using them for bus routes or multimodal connectivity. And in the meantime, in our city, which we would all agree, I'm sure, has been very haphazardly built, we need to make sure that we are doing everything we can with new developments going forward to require multimodal connectivity because you can't use transit if you can't access it. Um, we are not going to pave our way out of this problem. Anybody who has spent time looking at transit knows that you are not going to solve transit problems by increasing lanes. So we really have to look at some big, meaningful answers to our, our burgeoning transit issue. Thank you. Jim Gingrich. So congestion, transit, 
infrastructure is just one example of things that we have been talking about as a city for years and yet have done very little. I mean, we're, I'm sure tonight we're going to talk about things like affordable housing, education, safety. Again, issues that we have talked about. And the only thing that's different now is that these issues are more severe. Transit is, is, is an example of something that we have studied multiple times. There are studies sitting on a shelf in a three-room binder. We just need to start to get things done. Let me give you three things we should be doing. One, we have way too many pedestrian deaths in this city. We had 49 deaths last year. We need to do, we need to do common sense things in terms of sidewalks, speed calming, and, and, and just getting our dangerous intersections fixed. Second, we do need to do the basics. That is everything from keeping the roads in good condition to increasing the frequencies of buses on higher volume routes. The idea of Murphy's Row Pike is something that many have talked about. It makes sense. It's not a big capital spend, and you, particularly if you can get outside funding. And then last, let's face up to the fact that 90% of our population growth over the last five years has been in the counties that surround Davidson County. And those folks are commuting into the city. And so the only way that we are ultimately going to deal with congestion is if we have a regional solution. And that means working with the surrounding counties. Thank you. Vivian Thank Wilhoyt. you for the opportunity to be here this evening. I am Vivian Wilhoyt, and I look forward to serving you as your mayor. I ask you for your vote. David and Worry. Thank you for allowing me to be here, and also congratulations to Belmont for having this amazing, amazing forum. When I think about transit plan, I must say first that it has to benefit everyone, everyone in Davidson County. It cannot just benefit the few. The last transit plan as a council, as a, uh, with the area of the Metro Council where I served as a two-term council member, that transit plan did not and was not going to serve the people of Southeast Davidson. So one of the first things that we need to do is to sit down with the surrounding counties, work with the state and work with the federal government in order to bring about a comprehensive plan that is going to be regional and not be on the backs of taxpayers. That is so very important. And then we can also look at low-hanging fruit that we can also incorporate now. We can do light, lighting, um, uh, signaling, signaling of lighting to make sure that traffic flows. And then we can also look at the fact that 840, which is an option of working with the state, to expand it so that the big trucks would not have to come through, south, come through downtown and it can bypass downtown and go on its way and not create the more traffic jam that we have now. Again, the priority is that it's not be on the backs of taxpayers. We need to start now working year after year, but we cannot put it on the backs of taxpayers. Thank you. Our next topic is public safety. Nashville's violent crime rate is above both the national average and that of similar sized cities. Chief John Drake has spoken repeatedly about the number of stolen guns used to commit crimes, including one that critically injured a Metro officer earlier this month in Donaldson. What will you do as mayor to make citizens safer? Let's start with Alice Rowley, go down the line and end with Freddie O'Connell. Alice Rowley. Thank you, David. Uh, and public safety is the first job of the mayor. And right now, we are not keeping our citizens safe. We've had for the last three years more than 100 homicides. And according to federal crime data, two thirds of our crimes committed are never cleared. That means that our criminals are becoming more bold and our victims are feeling more helpless. The way that I propose to begin addressing the crime challenge in Nashville is to start with resetting the attitude we have with our police. I've never worn the uniform, but my husband did for 20 years, and I think part of making Nashville the best urban police force in America begins with respecting the work of our public safety officers. Secondly, we have to continue to look at our public safety, at our infrastructure as a critical asset to our city, to making Nashville thrive. And that means we've got to continue doing what we're doing and investing in making sure our police are the best paid. Also, I think that we've got to work and send a message through this election to the district attorney. This work of catch and release is not working. We cannot continue to not enforce legislation that is on the books that says that when you steal a firearm, you should spend 180 days in jail. 
When we continue to look the other way at crimes committed, we continue to make policing more difficult for our officers. Well, sure. So I referenced earlier the policy proposals that we released today. Actually, there are two proposals, David, as you may have seen in there, that talk specifically about the crisis in our city of guns being stolen out of cars. There are two plans that we talk about to expand the number of locks that are provided to Nashville, Davidson County residents so that they can secure their firearms if they have them in vehicles. And let me just take a moment to speak to the audience. If you have a firearm, please secure it. Have it be unloaded and safely secured in your car and in your home. It is vital to protect your family, but also to protect the rest of us, like this police officer who was killed by a gun that was stolen out of a car. Now, what we need to do to make the city safer is both make sure that our police department is fully staffed so that they aren't just having to chase from emergency to emergency, but can actually get out of the cars into the community, build relationships to build a, a safer community for everyone. But it's not just about policing. It's about having mental health professionals respond to crises rather than policing to help de-escalate very sensitive situations. But fundamentally, and this takes longer to implement, we need to reduce the amount of crime that's happening by providing better opportunities for Nashville's youth to engage in productive, engaged activity like summer youth employment. We'll do both when I am mayor. We need to reduce crime and provide better opportunities to hold folks accountable. Thank you. And th thankfully, the police officer was injured in this uh, recovering. But uh, council member. <clears throat> I think that's a great segue because the uh, Metro Council just approved $2.9 million to go to the Nashville Public Library for the NASA program that they continue to, brought, to provide the summer programs and after school programs for them. You have to get to the root of the problem before you can get to the fruit of it. And, uh, Poverty anywhere is a threat to prosperity everywhere. So I think we've got to focus on that and invest in those issues and those problems that we have when it comes to crime. But I also want to look at the fact of how can we incentivize people where these guns are taken out of the cars. My team and I were talking and thinking that perhaps what we could do is partner with some of the local restaurants. And if they are able to show that they have a safe box where they can keep their guns in the car, because I understand people wanting to feel protected and have use of them, they may be able to get a great meal, you know, or, or a free meal for their families. and and we work together as a community because I think the community, the police all have to work together. The best of us got to help the rest of us and we've got to address the problem so we can get to the place that we want to be. I want to make sure that we restore hope and prosperity on every block in every community and not leave one person behind. And when people are without, sometimes they do things that they should not. Thank you, Jeff Yarbrough. If our city gets everything else right but fails to keep people safe, it doesn't matter that we got everything else right. Safety is a prerequisite for leading this city and we know we have to do better. First, I think this has to start with the, the policing in our city. We need to have a fully staffed, well-trained, well-compensated and accountable police force. We know that we are some, uh, several hundred officers short right now. We know that's not uh, appropriate to keep us safe and we have to do better. Second, we have to do so much more when it comes to gun violence and I will put every city agency to work reducing gun violence and I mean across the board. So I worked with Chief Drake this year to try to propose legislation at the state level to actually crack down on illegal and unsafe storage of weapons which has led to an 800 percent increase in stolen firearms. And we have to, at the very least, engage in information campaigns to, do, to ensure that people that leave their guns in the console, like the one that was used to shoot uh, Detective Coble, that is not abiding by the law, it's breaking it. Second, we have to do a much better job of providing mental health care in all of our schools and better interventions in our juvenile justice system to ensure that we're making the meaningful interventions to prevent violent behavior before it starts to, uh, becoming a, a bigger and bigger influence on people's lives. Heidi Campbell. 
Uh, so public safety is the number one job of a mayor. And I was glad to see that Chief Drake revived the Police Activities League, um, which is a very important organization for making sure that our youth um, have something to engage with um, after school. And uh, it's worth noting that 24% of homicides and deaths in Davidson County are, um, are done by black males um, age 13 to 25. And we need to stop feeding the inequity in our state because it is a symptom, uh, in our city, because it is a symptom of a greater problem. And that means making sure that we are providing good after school programs. It means making sure that we are also investing in smart city technology. Smart city technology will give efficiencies that will increase um, street light um, activation and make sure that our neighborhoods are safer and that our energy is communicating with each other. And then we do actually need to increase our police force because we are um, very understaffed and um, make sure that we are supporting our police force with uh, the equipment that they need. Thank you. Tim Gingrich. Well, David, I, I, I think you're exactly right that the data would show that our violent crime rate is well above that of cities that I would consider to be peers. The trend is also not a good one. You know, 10 years ago, our homicide rate was about 6 per 100,000, and last year it was about 16 per 100,000. That is a 150 percent increase. We need to do better, and it has real human cost. I was at Warner Elementary, and I happened to engage with a third grade class, and I asked them, what is the one thing that Nashville needs? And what they said is more kindness, fewer knives, less stabbing, less shooting, more love, fewer killing. We are failing our kids. If that's what an eight or nine or 10 year old is thinking about, we need to do better. And we need to do at least three things. One is, it's not just that we are short in terms of where we have authorized our police force, we are short in terms of where we need to be by an even bigger amount. In, in 2020, it took nine and a half minutes to respond to a shooting. Last year, it took 16 and a half minutes. In addition, to funding the police force, we do need a comprehensive crime prevention strategy targeted at our vulnerable youth. There are things that are proven in other cities that could work here, and I will set up an Office of Public Safety to both engage with community partners as well as coordinate across our city Thank government. You, you know, as mayor, it is my responsibility to make sure that every department have what they need in order to be effective and to serve you. And when I think about public safety, I think it's very important. As mayor, we do our job in doing that by working with Chief, Chief Drake and the plans that he have to make our police force the best that it can be, investing in our police, our police officer, making sure that they're paid a competitive pay, working with the DA Funk in reference to that he has everything he needs to be able to keep people who are violent crime offenders in jail. And to also work with our judge, Callaway, in order to make sure that youth are also being served and making sure that they are given the access to services that they need, because that's getting to the root of why the crime occurred. So it's very important that we continue to fund those programs. But when we think about that, the fact that an idle mind is a devil's workshop, we have to give our youth opportunity, access to services. And that's why I'm so glad that in this budget, we're going to have our community centers open so that youth can come and be able to be in a safe space and be able to learn about ways that they can de-escalate issues. That is what we need to be doing. Th thank you very and much. that's what we would do if I am mayor. Thanks, David. Uh, on Christmas Day 2020, on 2nd Avenue, there was an unprecedented bombing in the part of the city that I represent. On March 27th at the Covenant School, uh, there was an unprecedented school shooting. These are two of the most dangerous scenarios we've seen in the city so far, and Chief Drake and the Metro Nashville Police Department did the city extremely proud. 
the kind of proud that makes us make national headlines for good reasons. That's why I'm so delighted that the budget that I worked on over the past few weeks with my colleague Kevin Roten, who I believe is here tonight, and Mayor Cooper, uh, does some important things. It makes sure that we compensate our first responders uh, in a very important way with a 6% cost of living adjustment. This is work that the council did, and I'm very pleased that uh, my colleague, Councilmember Roten, uh, listened to public employees, listened to us on council who were calling for this, and got us there. But safety also goes beyond policing, and this is where uh, the work of the Youth Violence Summit from years ago, uh, 2016, we heard from our young people about what keeps them safe, and it's things like training and employment opportunities and education. And the work of the past few years, again, is in this budget that I worked on with community safety partnership funds that create important organizations like The Village wrapping around vulnerable communities like Napier. But we can't stop there. Tonight, I think it's very important that people understand that the state legislature is about to have a special session, and that is where we need to get secure gun storage and cars laws. Thank you very much. All right, next question. Another big concern facing Nashvilleians is the skyrocketing cost of living. Too many people who work in the city can no longer afford to live in the city. And while the city's investment in affordable housing has increased in recent years, what specifically would you do differently to try to move the needle? We'll start with Matt Wilshire. Sure. Thank you, Rory. And as you know, this is what I did for three years before I launched my campaign for mayor. Um, after a career that I enjoyed very much in the private sector and then working in the mayor's office for eight years, in 2019, I moved to MDHA to work on one of the biggest challenges that was facing our city, the skyrocketing cost of living. It's going to take a broad-based approach, and at that time, we launched a plan to invest in the Envision program at MDHA that Phil Ryan helped start, who's here today, to transform areas of concentrated poverty into thriving mixed-income, mixed-use neighborhoods by adding additional low-income housing, workforce housing, and market-rate housing together at one location to improve the quality of life, to keep jobs, to keep housing near where their jobs are, and make it a safer and more successful community. We also need to work with the private sector. And in my three years at MDHA, through public-private partnerships, we helped develop over 4,000 units of affordable housing. We're going to need to increase that amount, again, by working with the private sector. The government can't do all of this, but we can work to make it easier for folks to build additional housing units along transit corridors, tying back to your question about transit, about how we can move around this city more easily while in increasing the amount of housing that's available for folks. So it's going to take a multifaceted approach, working with the public sector, the private sector, and the nonprofit sector so that we have the supply of housing to meet the demand for folks wanting to live here. Sharon Hurt. So I really appreciate and know that we have a housing crisis, not just in Nashville, but we have a housing crisis all over this country. So my approach is more about addressing the people. I'm about people, preservation, and prosperity. And I believe what we're going to have to do is create better jobs, better pay, to make sure that people are able to pay wherever they live. They will be able to afford. I think that there is an economic tsunami that is about to come. I want everybody who can to start their own businesses because I believe contracts, contracts, and more contracts are going to come with the new stadium as well as the East Bank redevelopment and all of the other developments that we see are coming across this country. We've got to prepare to make sure that every person has the opportunity to have economic equity and empowerment. And I believe that's where we need to go because the affordability of Nashville is not going to go down. So what we need to do is work to make sure that every person, not one person is left behind, but they are put in positions to have gainful employment as I did with workforce development when we had over 500 people hired for the Music City uh, Center as well as 2,000 that were trained, re referred for training and uh, over 500 with OSHA training. Thank you. Jeff Gilbert. One of my first priorities when upon being elected to the state Senate was housing. I literally wrote the law that put affordable housing into Tennessee law and created tools for Metro to use to build that housing. 
But the reality is we are not using those tools enough and we are barely nibbling around the edges of a problem that's getting worse and worse and worse. Our currently our effective affordable housing strategy is keep driving until you can afford something, which is a terrible affordable housing strategy and a bad transportation strategy to boot. We have to do a lot better. We got to do a couple things. One, we got to do a much better job of preserving affordability where it is. It does people very little good to the, to, if you're getting priced out of your own neighborhood and you're told that there's housing 15 miles away. We need to use property tax freezes and do better partnerships to rehabilitate homes to keep people in the neighborhoods that they help build. Two. We have to do a much better job of bringing the private sector off the sidelines and into this game. If you wait on just the government to build housing to solve this problem, we will solve it in the mid 2100s. We have to make it easier, quicker and faster for uh, companies to be, be part of housing. Third, we have to do down payment assistance programs to help our teachers, firefighters and cops who make this city work, be able to afford to live in the city they serve. Thank you. Heidi Campbell. There is a tipping point at which this is uh, not advantageous for anybody. And I was talking to a hotel owner the other day who was telling me that um, business is great, but he can't afford to keep his rooms clean because the staff that would clean the rooms can't afford to live here. People are getting priced out of Nashville, and this is an all-hands-on-deck emergency. We have to do something about this, and one single thing alone is not going to solve it. We're going to have to have a multifaceted approach to solving this problem. We need to do a survey of our public land. We have a lot of public land in our city that could be employed for affordable housing. Though the state precludes us from entering into agreements based upon for affordable housing requirements, we can certainly encourage companies that are moving here to invest in public land for affordable housing you know they also need to have employees that can afford to live in this city um, and then we need to continue to invest in and support artist co-ops and tech co-ops I was in the music business for many years and it's very sad for me to see a lot of my friends in the music business getting priced out of Nashville um, and then we also need to look at possibly using school land for housing for teachers RTI instructors council staff so that we can make um, some of our most important employees uh, make life easier for them and make it more affordable in our city for them. Thank you. Jim Gingrich. So I do at times in these conversations uh, feel like I've been transported back in time because if you watch the 2015 mayoral debate they were talking about the same thing and here we are today and the only thing that's changed is we've done multiple studies. Each one says it's worse than the last time we've done a study. But the situation is now a crisis. Because as you said, the people who serve the city, police officers, teachers, other metro workers can't afford to live in the city they serve. And the issue is now such that we need tens of thousands of units of affordable housing. That is a multi, multi-billion dollar challenge for us in Nashville. There are three things that we should focus on. Obviously, we should continue to properly fund the Barnes Fund, but that by itself is not going to be sufficient. The nonprofit sector cannot solve this on their own. We do need to think creatively about how do we think about the land that city holds and owns in a more strategic way to help facilitate this. But the real key is how do we get our private sector both to preserve and to build new housing. Nashville shouldn't be among the most difficult cities in the United States to construct affordable housing. And if you talk to anybody who does it, that's what they're going to tell you. It shouldn't be easier to do it in Cookville than it is in Nashville. And that means that we have to <laughs> we have to improve the way we interact with them and we Thank have you. to create better incentives so that they'll Thank do you. they'll actually put the billions to work that need to get put What's to your work. Time. Thank you, Vivian. When I think of affordable housing, I think of two groups of people. The people who've been here that we need to be protecting, and the people who are coming here that are wanting to stay live here in Nashville. And I'll say the third, my son who I have not been able to get him out of my house. <laughs> So when I think about the people who are here, I think of that gentleman that's sitting in this audience, Reverend Representative Love, who worked very hard to increase the income allowance for seniors to be able to apply for the tax freeze program. 
When I first went into the office of the assessor of property, that was one of the first conversations I had with Reverend Representative Love. And he knew that was going to be a very cross, to, heavy cross to bear, no pun intended. But my point is, he worked with the supermajority to get that income increase raised. Now more people can qualify and stay in their homes. As the assessor of property, I know this county parcel by parcel. And one of the things that I identified is that we have more than 200 vacant properties that's at least two acres plus that we can enter into public and private partnerships and begin to use the land that we have. If it's not making money, it's not making sense. And then when we think about the fact we have other vacant properties that's owned by Metro government that's idly just sitting, unused, schools, over in District 1, which is close to Jolton, we must do better to make what we have work for us. And that is what Thank I you. would do if as elected Thank mayor. You. Pretty will come. Thanks. Uh, so a few months ago, I voted to oppose the stadium deal because it felt like we were making the same type of mistake that has led to the, exactly this scenario. But what we can do different is take the East Bank Vision Plan, which has ambitious targets for affordable housing, and use our newly reclaimed public land to build housing so affordable that people that are working at the new stadium can afford to live there. That's something different. The other thing that is critically important that is something different that factors into every household in Nashville's cost of living is we can build the transit system that Nashville deserves. And we've already worked to build it into this budget that we're going to continue to make progress on not just community transit centers and communities that will use transit. And that's the healthcare and hospitality workers that work different shifts uh, that have to take the bus sometime at midnight or later. Uh, in order to avoid parking fees, a huge part of the cost of living on top of owning, main maintaining, insuring, and fueling a car. And that's different. We haven't done this as Nashville. We need to invest in that transit system, and we can. We have the operating capacity to do it, and we'll move forward. Now, we can also use the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act to part to use infrastructure investment in affordable housing. So often developers hit, and our affordable housing developers hit infrastructure costs. And as a mayor, it's time for us to coordinate. Instead of waiting for people to come to us when they discover that they're eligible for a property tax freeze, we can use the data in Metro to go identify every eligible property owner and actively enroll them. Thank you. Alice Wolf. Yeah. Well, I, I agree with a lot of the folks on this stage, um, and, and I would say in particular uh, Jim Gingrich. He's right. If we keep electing the same people, we won't get a different result. Ten years ago, when I worked for Governor Haslam, we designed an economic development plan, and the region has incredibly prospered. But Davidson County residents all or nearly all of their economic gains have been erased by our city's tax policy and by our city's planning to take a tax and spend approach to every problem that we have. So the first way to make our housing more affordable is to not raise taxes on our residents and to not continue to push them out and to push rents up when uh, rental property owners are forced to pass those increases on to residents. The second way is to do a lot of things that Senator Yarborough has helped lead at the legislature, which is to get government out of its own way. There are ways to speed along the permitting process, and I appreciate the legislation that he has passed to help with that. The longer it takes to construct new uh, housing, the more expensive that housing is due to the carrying costs. And the last thing, I think we've got to get our government into a place of being more customer focused, that we think less about defending each and every department and their turf, and we think more about getting a result for the people who live here. And I'd love the opportunity to do just that. Thank you. Let's turn our attention to schools now. As you know, Metro National Public Schools accounts for nearly 40% of the city's budget every year. This year, the district will get more than $1.2 billion. Everyone talks about wanting to improve schools, but in reality, the mayor has little control over how the schools are run. Would you support eliminating our elected school board and moving towards an appointed or hybrid model similar to what you'd find in places like New York or Chicago? Or does the status quo work as it is? Let's start with Sharon Hurt. I, I would continue to uh, 
allow the people to elect those school board representatives that we have because I think it's very important for them to have some engagement in what happens in our school system. What I do think we need to do is hold some accountability to the things that it is that they are doing. I do plan to have an office of accountability, efficiency, and enforcement. We have great rules, we have great policies and legislations, but they are not enforced. And I think that if we are able to have some type of community oversight in order for us to ensure that the schools are working properly, focusing on what's actually keeping our kids from learning and focus on that. I believe we're going to have to have some reading specialists to come in and ensure that our kids are reading. In their formative years, they learn to read. After that, they read to learn. If we are failing them from learning to read, then of course they're not going to be able to read to learn, and that puts them on a pipeline to to prison, and what we want to do is put them on a pipeline to prosperity. I think we've got to restore hope and prosperity with every family. We've got to make sure that they have the resources that they need, whether it's parenting classes, whether it's assistance. We have one-on-one -on -one reading literacy options available for them, but I definitely think that we're, it's got to be a community effort. Thank you. Jeff Yarbrough. So, no. Uh, as a parent of two children in Metro Nashville Public Schools, I want there to be a school ward member who's elected by citizens and who is focused every single day on our public schools. I just do. Uh, that does not mean that I don't think the mayor must be the leader on education in the city because I believe the, air, the mayor must be the leader of education in the city and accountable for the outcomes and results, and I gladly take on that mantle. I think the first thing the mayor has to do, you can't control everything, but you can make sure that resources are not the obstacle to our success as a city. The mayor, that does not mean writing a blank check, but it does mean making sure that there's accountability in place and also resources to make sure that the schools can do what, they, what, they, what is appropriate uh, for children. And I think the mayor in these times when teachers are facing declines in pay, difficulty housing, and just a genuine lack of respect across the board, the mayor needs to be a full partner in recruiting. I also think to be a real education mayor, you have to see as education is not just K-12, but prenatal to post-secondary. We need a complete overhaul in the way we do early childhood education, child care, pre-K here, so that more kids are starting ready to learn and work on the back end to make sure that more are getting the college degrees and certificates to be successful in, in later life. Thank you. Heidi Campbell. Amen on early childhood education. That's so important. Um, you know, we live in an incredibly regressive state, and uh, let's not conflate fiscal stability with fiscal responsibility. We do not fully fund education in this state. And even though Nashville spends over half of its budget on education, we do not fully fund education in this city, and we have incredible inequity. We are a red line city, so you have a school like Glendale in my district that does wonderfully, and parents put hundreds of thousands of dollars into that school. And then you have schools in other districts where you have moms who are working two jobs, single moms, and they are barely getting by, and they can't afford to put money into those schools. We have to, as a city, focus on triaging that inequity, because we all do better when we all do better. And we have haves and have nots in this city when it comes to schools. One of the ways that we can do this in a school that's not going to be fully funding education anytime soon is by hiring community school coordinators. That's a person whose day job at a school is to build support systems around the school through nonprofits, churches, businesses, and make sure that whatever the specific needs of that school are, are being met. And meantime, continue to push to get full funding for our public education um, from the state. Just very quickly, uh, Heidi Gamble, do you support eliminating the school board or uh, would you? Continue? Oh, uh, no, I, I think the school board does a great job and I, I absolutely don't support getting rid of the school board. Thank you. Jim Gingrich. <laughs> so um, I'm, a public, uh, I'm a product of public schools, as are my kids. Uh, 
You know, my, my parents came from difficult circumstances, but they were able to build a better life than what their parents had. And, and I was very fortunate and able to build a better life than what my parents had. Uh, that should be the dream of every kid in Nashville. But for way too many kids, that is just that, a dream. You know, if you're born poor in our city, you are more likely to remain poor than in 80% of the large cities in the United States. That is a statistic that we should not be proud of and that we should not accept. There is nothing more important than investing in our kids, and that does start with education. But I think none of us are satisfied with the outcomes that we currently have. I actually reject the notion that the mayor cannot operate within the current system and have a significant impact on how our school system is performing. I'm going to do three things, and I said start with me taking accountability, but I'm going to work with the superintendent to build a comprehensive five-year plan to improve outcomes in our schools. When we get agreement on that, I will fund the plan, and I'm also going to hold the school board and the superintendent and myself accountable for delivering on that plan and getting to better outcomes for our kids. Thank you. Vivian Wilhite? Um, no. Um, I do not support having school board members appointed. I believe that we should keep it as it is. The people knows best in reference to who they want to represent their district, and that's how we need to continue. But I must say this, as a mayor, I know that what my colleague just stated in reference to that he rejects the notion that um, full fun fully funding the school board uh, is all that we can do, and I agree with him. I agree with him that we need to do more. As a two-term council member, that is what I was told the entire time I served as council. Oh, we can't tell the school board what to do. Now, if you're giving more than half of your budget to the school system, we should be able to play a role. So I do believe accountability is so very important. We need to know when we direct for certain things to be done because we want to deal with the inequities that are happening in our school system, we need to come back the next year and find out, is that, is that what has been done? There was an old saying, there's a, 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 there was a saying that I learned from a, a presidential election um, that I was watching for a convention that says, uh, Jesse Jackson said he doesn't love his children equally, he loved them accordingly. So when it comes to our school system, we can't love them equally. We must give the schools that are failing the, the tools that they need if it means giving them more than what another school has had. So thank you very much. this, thank you. Thank you. Where do you come? David, I think if I'm choosing which elected bodies that uh, offer a threat to public education in Nashville, I'd probably choose the state legislature, not the elected school board. Uh, from vouchers to state authorized charter schools to a funding formula that's going to disadvantage Nashville over the long term, the state is really attacking the project of public education in Nashville. But I want to push back a little on the idea that the mayor doesn't have anything to do with public policy and education. Uh, mayor Dean led an important teacher recruitment initiative. Mayor Barry led a critically important early childhood literacy initiative. Mayor Cooper led both a new project that has our teachers being the best paid in the state of Tennessee, as well as making sure that teachers got paid family leave. It is very possible for mayors to impact education in this city, uh, and I would say the two projects that I would want to tackle as mayor are one that affected us directly. When we started in public schools at Aiken, where Matt and I both went, uh, and where our two daughters have gone. I basically lost a job because I found out the hard way that I didn't know the secret handshake to the aftercare program, and I had to leave the office every day at 3 p.m. Since, I've learned how many families couldn't choose public schools in Nashville because they didn't have an aftercare option. We need to make it easier for working families by expanding aftercare seats at metro schools. We also have the earliest high school start times in the country, and this is not a badge of honor. High schools in Nashville start at 7 a.m. This is bad for student performance and mental health, and we'll fix it. Thank you very much. Alice Rooley? Yep, you know, I, um, I, I mean, education is the single most important issue in terms of moving families from the, from the ability to get these maximum wage jobs that are coming to our city. And right now, our current organization is failing too many families. 
We are currently 95th out of all 95 counties on our high school preparedness, and I think that this is a concern for families um, about their choices being honored. Uh, this school board has the ability in the next two years to make a really critical decision. We as a city will either become Detroit or we will embrace choice and become Miami-Dade, an urban school system that spends less per student in a very expensive city than we do here in Nashville, that took their school system from F-rated to A-rated by embracing the choice of parents. Right now, the top 37 schools in our district are choice schools, either magnet or charter. And if this school board continues to deny parents the ability to choose the best child and the best school for their child, I think that we will continue to see state intervention. Parents had to go and beg the state to reopen our schools when every other school system in the region was reopened. And so I would like our school board to become accountable to parents and families. And if they can do that, I think they can keep their Thank role. Thank you very much. Uh, Matt Wilshire. Man, I, I don't want Nashville to be either Miami or Detroit. So I hope there's a third option that Nashville can just be the place in America with the best performing public school system in the country. And I believe that we can. And to do that, I will with, work with the school board which should continue to be elected so that parents have a voice in who are representing them and how the education system works. So I just released a plan, as I mentioned, on public education. It was put together with input from a couple of great former public school board members. And we have wonderful ideas, but it's gonna take collective action. And as your mayor, I will be accountable. If you can't work with the school board to convince them and the administration and the, and the MMPS that you have great ideas, then either they aren't great ideas or you're not a very good salesperson. But I think there are great things that we can do. Now, I will say that the funding numbers are not exactly as they've been laid out here. Over the last 10 years, in fact, the Metro National Public Budget, Public Schools budget, has gone from being 42% of our budget down to 37%. It's not over 50%, it's 37% in the current budget, even with increases in teacher pay. Now we need to make sure we are pursuing innovative approaches to make Nashville's schools the best performing in the country. And as your mayor, I will work with the school board to make that happen and come back to report to you, Thank you very in much. four years. Our next question, as Nashville has grown, so has the tension between providing for residents and attracting tourists. For years, we've been focused on downtown development and it's paid off, but at what cost? How do you plan to balance the demands of development and quality of life concerns for residents? We'll start with Jeff Yarbrough. I think people in Nashville feel like the growth and development, including some of the tourist issues are happening to us rather than for us. And I think that's what the next mayor's got to get right and rebalanced. So we have invested a great deal of resources in a tourist economy. We have thousands and thousands of residents of our city who make their living in the tourist industry. And so I think it's not really responsible to create a dynamic where we're pitting residents against tourists. But I do think that we need to see uh, a tourism that we can be proud of. And I think that's not always what we see. Uh, so I worked with uh, the tourist sector itself to create new regulations to build a downtown that we can be prouder of, to get regulations for the party buses, to add an additional tax so that you're spending a little bit extra on beer on Broadway so that there's a little bit extra dollars to do cleanliness and safety work there. But I think fundamentally, I wanna see a tourist sector that we wanna be part of ourselves. We need to see the type of, I wish we had a better family tourism appeal. We should be thinking about our cultural and history and heritage tourism and have that be more of our strategy because I think the, the way we brand ourselves to others, also the way we brand ourselves, we think of ourselves and I think we want to be proud of the city we are, are, are marketing to the world. Thank you. Heidi Campbell. Are we building a place to visit or a place to live? That is the tagline of my campaign. And that's how I think a lot of Nashvillians feel where there's been a huge focus 
um, on downtown development. You know, when I was a kid growing up, downtown was tumbleweeds. And, uh, and now it's bachelorettes and pink hats. And, um, and it is by far the most active area of our town, but it has very little to do with the Nashville that any of us know. Um, and so we need a mayor that's going to focus on Nashville businesses and Nashville, giving Nashville love going forward and making sure that we are uh, not focused on out-of-town developers coming in and, um, and tourist attractions, but on Nashville businesses and the areas of Nashville that are struggling the most. Um, and that also means investing in our arts. We have um, a lot of sports here, and that's a good thing, but we haven't put a lot of money and energy and love into our arts programs. And I think that uh, we should have a world-class theater, and we have a great museum, but we need to put more into that, and we need to put more into um, to arts education as well. So, um, so I think that, um, I think that uh, going forward, we need to be focused on building a place to live more than a place to visit. Jim Gingrich. So the tourism and hospitality industry is a very important part of the Nashville economy. It is a very important tax generator for our city government. It is in our interest to see that be a sustainable and healthy business going forward. But I worry about our tourism industry because there is just too many things that make me concerned. You know, when, when folks see tax dollars being spent on stadiums and speedways, they worry about priorities. When a downtown that is supposed to be live, work, and play increasingly becomes difficult from both a live and play standpoint or just getting down to cultural events, that's a real issue. Once an industry loses the support of the city in which it resides, that is a big danger sign. We need more leadership out of the mayor's office to talk about with the industry what does tourism 2.0 look like. It does need to be, in my mind, more family friendly, more diversified, involve other parts of the city, make sure that we know what our brand is and we don't drift from the iconic institutions that and iconic venues that were so important to establishing our brand to monster trunk event monster monster truck events you. at you know a large Thank stadium. You. Vivian Wilhoy. Worry, could you repeat the question? Sure. <laughs> Uh, for years, we've been focused on downtown development. The question is, how do you plan to balance the demands of development and quality of life concerns for residents? So the mayor's job is to grow the city. When you grow the city, it's a good thing. It could be a blessing, but it could be a curse. All right? So when you talk about growing the city, my platform is, is to have stronger neighborhoods and stronger businesses. You cannot or will not be in a stronger neighborhood if you don't have a good job. You have a good job, you're going to want to live in a stronger neighborhood or a good neighborhood. We could have both. We deserve both. The problem between growth downtown and as serving as a two-term council member is that there is no communication. When I was a council person, it was hard for me to vote for the convention center because the people in Southeast Davis said, said, that doesn't benefit me. But in fact, bringing growth to the city does benefit neighborhoods because it helps pay for the services. For the first time as a assessor of property, when we did the reassessment in 2017, for the first time in Davidson County history, the commercial assessed value outpaced residential, as it should. That's who should be bearing the brunt of the burden of Nashville. So I do believe that we could have both. I do believe it brings communication, but it needs to be strong for everyone. Nashville has been strong, but it has not been strong for everyone. We must be asking these big companies to Thank pay their fair share if they want to come Radio here. Radio comment. <clears throat> Nashville is music city and always should be. And a few months ago, our family was lucky to catch uh, a performance of Opry at the Ryman. 
And it was great. We had actually taken a friend from out of town there. And she was a visitor to the city, and she loved it. And then we pulled out of the parking garage right across the street from the Ryman Auditorium where a party bus was blaring a song whose lyrics I will not repeat on television. That's not the Music City that I'm talking about. It's not the Music City that's the Music City of the Country Music Hall and Fame and Museum, the Skirmerhorn Symphony Center, the National Museum of African American Music, all of which are downtown developments. It's not the Music City of the Jefferson Street Sound Museum or Studio A or Studio B, a part of Music Row that are popular tourism destinations. We don't have to leave on our bachelorette's welcome sign. We can turn it off. And this is part of the issue. The CVC and state have partnered on the stadium deal. They've partnered on the NASCAR deal at the fairgrounds. And we don't have to accept these deals. Even this term, we're still working on that. As mayor, when we considered the stadium deal, we literally heard the finance team describe it as a Las Vegas-like destination event. And I thought, I don't want that. I want more Ville, less Vegas. And that's what we're going to work on when I'm mayor. And the principal job of the mayor over the next four years is going to be to invest in ourselves because that goes back to the cost of living things. The cost of living and quality of life are together. Thank you. Alice Wolf. Yeah, I think we have to be careful uh, what we wished for. About six years ago when I was in leadership, Nashville, the head of our Convention Visitor Bureau, said to our class that he wanted Nashville to be the adult entertainment destination. And as someone growing up here, I thought, I, I didn't know with young children, did I actually want that? But it seems like we made it where we aimed. Here's the challenge that we have now. We know downtown is unsafe, both for our tourists and for our residents. We know that the Convention Visitor Bureau says we have a roofie problem. We see people from all over the country end up having an experience here in Nashville that is not the Nashville we want them to remember, that most of their time is spent filing a police report for stolen money uh, when they were passed out. I would say that the experience economy that we have built is important to Nashville's role as the music city. We know that artists' royalty and streaming is, is lower now and that live performances are an incredibly important aspect of music monetization. But we've got to bring our Nashville Chamber, not just the Convention Visitor Bureau, but our Nashville Chamber that has fled the downtown and our commercial property owners that own a massive amount of downtown property to reset the balance. Otherwise, we will end up with empty office buildings, rising crime, and a Nashville downtown that no one wants to go to. Thank you. Matt Wolf. So, Rory, downtown, let's set the table here a little bit. Downtown represents 0.4% of the acreage of Davidson County, generates 12% of the property taxes, and 26% of the sales taxes. It is an incredibly important economic engine for our city and employs tens of thousands of our neighbors. So it is important that to make sure that that is a sustainable part of the engine that can help create sidewalks in neighborhoods, affordable housing, and the best performing public schools in the country, we need to make sure that it can be a safe place for folks to continue to visit. We need to make sure that there is a balance between the live and the work and the play. I grew up in Nashville, graduated from Hume Fogg High School, and when I looked down the street, there was nothing happening down Broadway, nothing. There was no Bridgestone Arena, there was no Skirmer Horn, and there were no visitors. So we've tried not having it and i am not saying we need to boom even more we need to evolve the tourism industry in nashville to make sure there are more things for families to do i'm very hopeful about an arts district on the east bank to diversify what we have and to bring more of a balance between the live and the work and the play but folks who say we just need to turn off the lights and tell everyone to go away mean that there will be a lot of people who are unemployed and declining value in the city and that's Thank not you. what we want either sharon Growth is created to help the decline. What we have is a problem that because it has not reached every part of Nashville. Now, Michael Jordan is downtown, and he gets his points, but he's got to get Scottie Pippen in the game for North Nashville, Dennis Rodman for East Nashville, Tony Kuko for South Nashville, and Steve Kerr for West Nashville. We need those ambassadors using that economic, and then they need a coach 
Phyllis Jackson, because we need a change, okay? There is time for a change, someone that can monitor and make sure that everybody gets in the game in order for us to be able to have the championship team, the champion city that this city deserves. We've got to spread the wealth and we've got to be intentional and deliberate about doing so. I would have an economic de development department with four ambassadors for all of the quadrants to make sure that the money that we are receiving is being distributed evenly because a rising tide lifts all boats. And it is important for everyone in Nashville to benefit from the exponential growth that we are seeing. That's the problem that we have. We've got to change it. Nothing changes if nothing changes. And I am the change that this city needs. Thank you. Speaking of development, the mayor's office has pushed two high-profile projects in recent months, the new Titan Stadium and a plan to bring NASCAR back to the fairgrounds. While the Titan Stadium was approved by the Metro Council, how will you guide the development around it, and where do you stand on the racetrack proposal? Heidi Campbell. Yeah, so um, this racetrack proposal is uh, very problematic. That They haven't taken into consideration parking. When I was the mayor of Oak Hill, uh, one of the biggest complaints that I had was from people uh, saying that they, um, they heard the sound from the racetrack, and we're talking about increasing um, the, the noise pollution. Um, so we do have a, a NASCAR racetrack, um, you know, close to our city. And I, as I understand it, this would be one of the only Bristol Motor Speedway racetracks that's right in the middle of a city. And I think it's problematic for the neighborhood. Um, and it's um, something that certainly hasn't been designed um, to the approval of the people who live near it. So um, I think that that's something that needs a lot of work um, if, if it even should be done. Um, and, um, you know, I learned a big lesson when I was a mayor of City of Oak Hill and I, um, I had a multimodal plan and I did not get citizen buy-in and you would have thought that I was killing puppies. It was like a Williamson County School Board meeting every day. Um, so, you know, if we're going to do something like that, we need to make sure that it's something that works for the neighborhood and I don't think that that has been done. Thank you very much. Jim Gingrich. So the Titans deal is a done deal at this point, but uh, I do think it has important lessons for y'all who are trying to make a choice in this election. You know, last July, I wrote a letter to the council, published an op-ed explaining the difficulties that I had with the deal as it was structured. Not that I'm against the new stadium, but I thought that was about the worst structured deal that I could imagine. And the fact is, when you think about fiscal responsibility and priorities, the fact that most people on this stage supported that deal says something that you cannot forget. I'll tell you the other thing that about blew my mind is that when we were asked at another station's uh, forum, would you support giving money for, to bring Major League Baseball, these same folks said, it's a bad idea to give public subsidies to billionaires. So look, on the, on, in terms of the, the, the speedway, uh, it has a lot of issues. The financials aren't strong. The city's going to have to back every dollar of those bonds. It's opposed by people who live in the neighborhood. As Heidi mentioned, there are logistical issues. This is another example of misplaced priorities and doing bad deals. We need to focus on other stuff, like how do we get a Nashville General Hospital in place the fact that we're not focused on that, and that lease runs out in 27, and it takes four years to build a hospital, Thank you is an much. issue. Vivian Willard? Well, in reference to the Titans deal, that ship has sailed. But I think, to, as mayor, it's going to be important that the deal details are carried out where it benefits Nashville, whether it's the East Bank development and how that's supposed to be, or the other items that are within the deal itself, we need to make sure that the deal is carried out the way it should be and it's going to benefit Nashville. Now, we are always doing these super entertainment type deals, but I wonder sometimes, do we ever remember that it is the people that live here that needs to benefit? 
We need to make sure that whenever these type of entertainment deals, sports deals that are done, that there is benefit for the people, not only just downtown, not just in North Nashville. I live in East Nashville. I want East Nashville to benefit. I want, I want no, no, uh, uh, South Nashville to benefit. Those areas need to benefit and feel sometimes what we feel like is not being done. They need to feel as if they are, that they matter. People matter. And whenever we're spending taxpayers, taxpayers' dollars, we need to make sure that they're at the table. So when it comes to the racetrack deal, the noise audience is something, ordinance is something that needs to be put in place so they can have a good quality of life where they are. I'm not against racing. I love racing. Thank you very much. But I want to keep the noise in check for the neighbors that live Thank in that you. area. Freddie O'Connell. The, before there was a stadium deal, there was one of the most important legacies that will come from Mayor Cooper's planning initiatives, which is the East Bank Vision Plan. If you haven't looked at it, it's worth taking a look at. It has a lot of vision uh, for what the East Bank can become. And not just in the footprint of the Titan Stadium, it's bigger than that. Uh, it showcases what we can do from River North all the way down through PSC. So as mayor, that's what I want to focus on. We need to get a cluster of brand new urban neighborhoods around the stadium so that it's not just a junior version of our entertainment district. And we do need to come back to that affordable housing that I talked about earlier. And we need the infrastructure decisions we make there to connect into East Nashville and across the river into downtown, not avoiding it entirely. Uh, and we need it not to be an extra lane of I-24. We need it to be connective tissue for a great new set of neighborhoods. But that's not enough. The next mayor is going to have to invest capital there to allow people to play football in 2027. Uh, but we need to make sure that we demonstrate to the other 500 square miles of Nashville that we're going to make companion investments there. That's going to be my priority. These deals were not my priority. The NASCAR deal is not my priority. I focused on the priorities I want to start on day one in the budget we just approved. I don't know what's going to happen to the NASCAR deal. I'll review it. What we've seen so far doesn't seem like something that's going to be able to pass in this council. And I look forward to having a future conversation about the fairgrounds. But right now, I'm focused on the priorities of what Nashvillians need. Thank you. Ellis Riley? Yeah, earlier this week, Wallet Hub came out with rankings of the top 149 cities, and it placed Nashville 125th for the management of our city and the management of our finances. But more importantly, it put us dead last, tied with San Francisco and New York, as a city with the largest share of long-term debt per capita. That means deals that have been worked on for decades by a lot of folks on this stage are creating a nearly unsustainable environment for us to build a thriving city. And that debt doesn't include the $760 million in bonds that the Sports Authority will now have to issue with the new Titan Stadium. So I think our big concern here is how have we allowed our budget and our city to be so skewed to burden our children and our grandchildren with decisions that we are not able today to pay for as we're moving forward. And secondly, I think we have to recognize that the balance has moved too far away from the will of the voters. We saw in 2011 that 70 percent of voters asked for us to continue having fairgrounds racing. And systematically, decades have gone by where we have chosen to place an MLS soccer team there to push racing out, to follow, to not look at multiple places in the county. And so I think we have a real issue Thank of you trust. Thank you, Matt Wilshire. So I grew up not far from here, a few blocks away, and I remember as a kid hearing the sounds of racing as I fell asleep at nights. Um, I visited the Fair Park and um, rode the rickety wo wooden roller coaster that was out there. Any Nashville natives will remember that fondly. Um, the fairgrounds has evolved and changed, and um, I'm a racing fan myself. I do have some concerns about the proposal and putting public dollars into funding an additional investment into a neighborhood. Um, those are things that need to be explored. It does seem like it's being pushed through pretty quickly in this council, but we'll deal with that uh, when it comes up. In terms of the East Bank, that is an incredible opportunity for our city and one that we'll be developing over several decades. But the next mayor is going to need to set us on a path to make sure that that area develops in a way that has affordable housing. 
just like the area that I worked on across the interstate at Casey, so that we have a mix of incomes, folks living together and working together, where we can have housing that's close to the jobs in an area that develops in a way that's welcoming to families. I mentioned in an earlier answer, having an arts district there, a place where families can go, Nashvillians can enjoy. And those are the things I think we need to be most focused on in the redevelopment of the East Bank. But one thing I'm very concerned about is investing hundreds of millions of dollars in infrastructure. We need to work with the developers to make sure that that cost is borne more by them than by Nashvillians. Thank you, Sharon Hurt. Thank you. You know, I, I, I hear about the uh, long debt. You know, some people in this city understand long debt. We kind of call it layaway. Uh, but I am so interested. Uh, I did vote for the stadium because I was especially uh, happy about the East Bank development. And I was able to put a 25% deal for a small minority and women-owned businesses to make sure that we're able to have some other communities share in the wealth. Just like I did with the airport when I was able to talk to Doug Krulin and he said that he had 13% minority women owned concessionaires and now it is 45%. He had $30 million in uh, minority contract and now he has 500 million because I've been a chief advocate for that. I think that the city right now needs healing. We've got the stadium deal that is was very, very tough. The tornado, COVID, the bombing, and we have a tale of two cities. I think the people need healing and we need to listen to their voices. I am leaning toward no in terms of the racetrack right now because the racetrack was there and the community was built around it, and I think we've got to do more in focusing on the people. Again, I am about people, prosperity, and preservation. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Jeff Yarbrough. Uh, when the Titans Stadium was before us, I sponsored legislation to get your property taxes out of the football stadium business, uh, because I think that's right, and push those dollars onto the hotel taxes and to the development surrounding the stadium. Uh, for similar reasons, I'm a little bit skeptical of the racetrack deal because I think it puts the property taxes that we use on police, on education, back at risk. And while I'm a racing fan myself, I think the first job is to make sure that we're safeguarding the dollars that we use to educate our children and, and maintain a safe, uh, vibrant city. The next mayor unquestionably has to get the East Bank right. It is already in the midst of developing and it is a unique opportunity to turn on what is now a lot of parking lot space and make it part of our city. You have to do that right in, in by incorporating affordability, incorporating walkability, transit options. You ought to be able to live there as a family near school or as a, you know, sort of a an elderly family downsizing without feeling like you're attending a 72 hour bachelorette party every week. We sh need to make sure that there's actually a high quality of life there. And we need to use those same principles, not just in East Nashville, but across the city. I think the city is ready for us to walk and chew gum at the same time and wants to see just as many late night meetings about the future of Madison and Donaldson as they saw about the, the future of the East Bank. Thank you. We've come to our final question, and because of time, 60-second answers, please. One of the biggest challenges facing the next mayor will be our relationship with the state. Why do you think you're the best candidate to repair political strains with the Republican supermajority? We'll begin with Jim Gingrich. So it is certainly really frustrating that we got a bunch of folks playing political games rather than worrying about what's best for the people they serve, be it the city of Nashville or the state. Uh, we're all going to talk about the fact that we have great relationships or that we're going to build relationships with the legislature and the governor. But I do think a more strategic approach is needed. You know, we talked earlier about transit. The only way we're going to have a regional transit plan, if we have a mayor that invests a significant amount of time to build the relationships with our neighboring counties, our neighboring mayors, because we also share a lot of other things as well. We're all part of the same economic ecosystem, a system that accounted for 50% of the economic growth of the state in the last 10 years. We also share so many issues with the cities across the state. 
affordable housing, education, and the like. If you're in Cookville, you have an affordable housing issue. If you're in Dixon or in you're in Chattanooga, and we need to be the convener that brings that group together and start having conversations with the legislature about Thank you. statewide hard issues. Hard reset. We need to start with a hard reset. People who have voted against the Republican National Convention vote against the people's interests for jobs. That should have not happened. We need to stop petty politics and start putting people first. We are more alike than we are different. We bleed the same way. We must get to the table and talk. We must come to a consensus of things that's going to benefit you, the people. The biggest challenge is going to be, in addition, to continue to make sure that Nashville is a welcoming city. This city should be for anyone that wants to come here and thrive and raise their children, whether you're black, white, tall, short, American, wanting to be an American, gay or straight. This should be a welcoming city. That is the pride of Nashville. And guess what? It's Pride Month. But that is the joy of Nashville. And we must get back to that. Thank you. Thank you. Radio Con. Anybody up here who tells you that they have the uh, secret sauce is bad at or lying, because it has never been as bad as it was this session. And so now we figure out where we go from here. And I can't tell you that I have it figured out, but I can tell you what I'm going to do and what my experience has been. As a former board member of Cumberland Region Tomorrow, a regional nonprofit that brings together cities and counties, and a former National MTA board member that did a lot of that same work as we built out regional coordination, uh, I know that our 10 county region can stand strong together, just like we can stand with our other major cities in Tennessee. I can tell you I'm proud of a bipartisan base of support that has supported me in every election I've run in. Uh, and we'll take a lot of the support we've gotten right onto Capitol Hill so that we know that we're having the right conversations with the right people. Uh, but fundamentally, the mayor will invest in us. And that is one of the best tools we have against state overreaches, strategic use of public dollars to invest in ourselves. Thank you. Alice Rowley. The relationship with the state is one of the main reasons that I, as a lifelong Nashvilleian, got into this race. The highest point in Nashville-Davidson County is named for my great-grandfather, Ganyer Ridge, at Radnor Lake. And that's a state park. It's not a city park, and most residents don't care that it's a state park. They care that they have a park instead of 300 homes in that beautiful area. I think to reset the relationship with the state takes electing a kind of a person who has always operated with the concept that you can love Nashville and love Tennessee. I'm the only person on this stage who's gone to meet with the head of the 70 County Mayor's Caucus and multiple regional mayors who are supporting my candidacy because they need to see Nashville succeed. We are not an island. We are part of a family and we've got to get back to solving problems for the families that live here and put politics and partisan labels aside. So I've got a proven track record. A proven track record of adding jobs for Nashvillians, a proven track record of adding affordable housing that is actually attainable for folks who work here. And I've got a proven track record of building relationships with the state. I did it when I was in ECD, working with then Commissioner, now U.S. Senator Haggerty, and with Commissioner Boyd. And I've done it when I was at MDHA working with Ralph Perry and the great folks at THDA. So I have a track record of having built relationships. But importantly, I will also work with the rest of the folks in Nashville because we are in this together. The business community can work with the folks at the state legislature. Activists who are speaking the truth about what's really happening here. We're all in this together. And the mayor has a responsibility to lead this coalition, and I will do that, but I need the help from all of you and those folks around the state who want to see us be successful. Thank you, Sharon Hurst. So I think it's gonna take communication, understanding and being understood. It's gonna also take challenge because they have done overreach when it comes to our city. It's part of a hypocrisy move that they're making, tell the federal government that they can't talk, come in and do what the state does, and now they're trying to tell us what to do. I think it's gonna take charm, and I have that charm, and I also have the bravado to do it. And not only that, um, if I talked to the governor, he said that he's willing to talk to 
anybody, and I told him I'd talk to him too, but not today because my feet were hurting on the, with those shoes I had on. So I got to schedule something a little bit later. And if I can't talk to him or his other male colleagues, I'll just talk to their wives because these two I got already in pack. Thank you, Jeff Yarbrough. Uh, the job of the next mayor is too hard and too important for someone to be learning this part on the job. And with all due respect to my, my colleagues here, no one in this race can match the depth and breadth of experience I have working with the state and getting things done for the city. I have personally worked with and negotiated with the last two governors on passing infrastructure investments that did good work for Nashville. I have stood up to legislative overreach and won. We're going to have a, a runoff in this election because I scuttled the proposal that was going to eliminate it. We're going to vote on 40 council people this fall instead of 20 because I worked with Metro Legal every day to make sure that that was going to be possible to happen. And when this city has needed someone to fight on its priorities from affordable housing to transit to public schools to cleaning up downtown, I've been the one who's been doing that work, bridging divisions, building coalitions and getting it done. I'm Jeff Yarbrough and I want to ask for your vote. Thank you. Heidi Campbell. I believe that Nashville needs a mayor, I mean a mom, a mom in the mayor's office. The men in this race keep telling us that we need a CEO. I am a Vanderbilt MBA, a businesswoman, a former mayor and a state senator, and I can tell you that that is not what we need. We do not need a person who's focused on maximizing shareholder value on the backs of Nashvillians. When my kids are sick, I will do anything that I can to get them better. And when a development was threatening to destroy my my neighborhood, I stopped it and I ran for mayor. And when I saw politicians abusing their power at the state assembly, I flipped the first state senate seat we flipped in over 25 years to shift the balance. This is what moms do. They find a way. And when our city's under attack, our daughters' rights, LGBTQ families, black and brown brothers and sisters, are, and their rights are being taken away, and our kids are being shot and 20,000 of our neighbors are unhoused, I find a way. Nashville doesn't need a CEO. Nashville needs a leader, a Thank communicator, you. a protector, and a defender. Nashville needs a mom. <laughs> Thank you all very much for taking part tonight. Thank you to Belmont and hosting in this beautiful facility. Thank you all. Thank you at home for watching. A reminder, our next debate is Thursday, July 6th. That'll be at American Baptist College. Early voting begins July 14th, Election Day. August 3rd. Thanks to my co-moderator, David Plazis. Thank you at home for watching. Have a good night. Now, during the Rooms to Go July 4th mattress sale, get this very special offer. Sleep better and save big when you buy this Sealy Posture Pedic, Serta Perfect Sleeper, or Beauty Rest Select mattress in your choice of sizes for only $5.95. That's three great brands, any size, one low price. Twin, full, queen, even a king size mattress, just $5.95. Plus, check out all our other great mattress buys during the Rooms to Go July 4th mattress sale going on now. Find out what your guaranteed offer would be and receive the strongest cash offer in the industry. Mark Spain Real Estate is the most trusted real estate team in the U.S. with nearly 10,000 five-star reviews. Sell your home for maximum profit without the hassle of putting it on the market. With the guaranteed offer, there are no showings, no open houses, no stress. Work with the most experienced real estate team in the U.S. and close with confidence. Go to MarkSpain.com to get a guaranteed offer in your home today and start packing.